Welcome back to Fundamentals of AC Circuits. In this video, we're going to discuss series parallel RLC circuits. So the objectives of this video are that you will be able to determine the impedance of an RLC circuit and analyze a series parallel RLC circuit. So when we have an RLC circuit, this basically implies that we have some sort of combination of capacitors, resistors, and inductors connected to an AC source. So as we go through this particular lecture, we're going to look at a few examples of different orientations of series parallel RLC circuits. And we're going to take the same approach that we've used in other series parallel circuits. We're going to look for relationships. We're going to look for things that can be combined in series. We're going to look for things that can be combined in parallel. And we're going to use our um, definition of impedance for the capacitor, the resistor, and the inductor in order to do that. So we're going to be relying on the equations and the relationships we've used in previous lectures related to RL circuits and RC circuits to put all of this together. So if you look at the example circuit on the screen, this is a series parallel RLC circuit. The resistor and the inductor are in parallel, so we would begin by combining those first. And we do have the equation that was given in the lecture video about RL circuits that will allow you to combine a resistor in parallel with an inductor. If you prefer, you can also use product over sum. Product over sum will work every single time as long as you set it up correctly and execute it properly. So once we combine the R and the L in parallel, we'll have an impedance and we're going to combine that with the impedance of the capacitor. And that's going to give you your total impedance for the circuit. So we're going to be using all of the techniques we've discussed thus far in order to analyze series parallel RLC circuits. So we're going to do three examples and here's example number one. We have a series parallel RLC circuit shown on the screen, and we're going to find a bunch of things about this circuit. We're going to find the total impedance, the total current, the voltage across every component, the phase difference between the total current and the source, the current through R2. We're going to draw a phasor diagram for all of the voltages in the circuit, and then we're going to determine is the circuit predominantly inductive or is it capacitive? meaning which element has more of an effect on the behavior of the circuit, the inductor or the capacitor. So we're going to start with total impedance of the circuit written in polar form. To begin, we're going to calculate Z1. Z1 is the series combination of R1 and XL. We know that to combine a resistor in series with an inductor, we're going to do R plus JXL. So we're going to take the value for the resistance and the value for the inductive reactance, which is given in the diagram. XL is provided. And we're going to combine that to find Z1. Once you have Z1, convert it to polar. Next, we're going to calculate Z2, which is the resistor in parallel with the capacitor. So we're going to use the formula provided for a resistor in parallel with a capacitor in order to find Z2. Once you plug and chug the values for R2 and Xc, you will see that Z2 is equal to 0.45 kilo ohms at an angle of negative 63.43 degrees. And then we're also going to convert that to rectangular. Why did I do that? Well, I'm thinking ahead. If you look at Z1 and you look at Z2, they're in series with one another. So I'm going to have to eventually combine them, which means I'm going to have to add Z1 and Z2 together. In order to add these two impedances together, I need them both to be in rectangular form. So I went ahead and completed that step now because I can look ahead and see I'm going to need that rectangular form in a minute. So I have Z1 and I have Z2 written in both rectangular and polar forms. And I will then combine them together to get the total impedance for the circuit. So we'll take each rectangular form, add like terms, convert to polar. Here's our total impedance for the circuit, 1.2 kilo ohms at an angle of 4.76 degrees. Now 
Now we're going to find the total current in the circuit in polar form by taking the source voltage and dividing by the total impedance. And the phase difference between the total current and the source is going to be negative 4.76 degrees or the total current lags the voltage source by 4.76 degrees. Next, we're going to find the total voltage for R1, R2, the capacitor, and the inductor, everything written in polar form. So we're going to start with R1. We know the total current in the circuit. We know the total current must be flowing through R1 because R1 is in series with the source. So we can use Ohm's law to find the voltage for R1. We're also going to use Ohm's law to find the voltage for the inductor. Remember, we're going to write the impedance of the resistor at 1 kilo ohm at angle 0 degrees, the impedance for the inductor as 0.5 kilo ohms at an angle of 90 degrees. So the voltage for R1 and the inductor are pretty straightforward because we know the current going through them. We can use Ohm's law. Next, we're going to find the voltage for R2 and XC. Since R2 and the capacitor are in parallel, we can find the voltage for Z2. If we find the voltage for Z2, we find the voltage for what Z2 replaced, which is the parallel combination of R2 and XC. So in order to find the voltage for Z2, I'm going to set up a voltage divider. Remember, Z1 and Z2 form a series relationship. They're in series with one another. That means I can set up a voltage divider to find the voltage drop just across Z2. And here's the equation for that voltage divider. Z2 divided by ZT, that's my total impedance for this series path, multiplied by the source. So when you complete that calculation, you will have the voltage for R2 and the voltage for the capacitor, which comes out to be 1.88 at an angle of negative 68.19 degrees. Next, we're going to find the current through R2. We just found the voltage across R2, so we can use Ohm's law to find the current through R2. So take the voltage across R2, divide by R2's value, which is 1 kilo ohm at an angle of 0 degrees, and you will have the current for R2. Here's our phasor diagram showing the voltages for the source, R1, L1, R2, and C1. So we have our source, 5 at an angle of 0 degrees, R1, R2, and C1, and the inductor. Here's problem 2, another series parallel RLC circuit. It's a ladder network for the most part. And we're going to determine the following, the impedance of the circuit in polar form, the total current, the voltage across R2, and the current through capacitor 2. Let's start by identifying relationships. R2 is in parallel with the inductor. These are in parallel. Once we combine those, what's left will be in series with XC2. Once we combine that, what's left will be in parallel with R1. Once we combine that, what's left will be in series with XC1. So we're going to start from the right, work our way to the left, making those combinations one step at a time. So I'm going to call the, par the parallel combination of XL and R2, I'm going to give that a new name, I'm going to call it Z1. That's the combination of just this inductor and R2. So we're going to combine those using the formula provided for a parallel inductor and resistor, and you'll get the impedance for Z1, 4.2 kilo ohms at an angle of 58 degrees. Next, we're going to calculate what I call Z2. Z2 is going to be the combination of Z1, these are now combined, and XC2. So this parallel combination is in series with XC2, 
So we're going to add these two impedances together. We're going to start by doing that in rectangular form. So first convert Z1 from polar to rectangular, which is already done right here on the screen. We've taken Z1, converted it to rectangular. So we're going to fill that in for Z1. Now we're going to write the value of XC2 in polar form. This is a capacitor. It has a capacitive reactance of one kilo ohm. In polar form, we would write that as one kilo ohm at an angle of negative 90 degrees. In rectangular form, that comes out to minus J1. So when we add these together, we still have to consider the polarity of each component, and we have to consider how we would write this impedance in polar form and how that translates to rectangular form. Just because we're adding two impedances together doesn't mean I get to just say 2.25 plus J 3.6 plus J1. We can't do that. This is a capacitor. So always remember when we write our, ca our capacitive reactance in polar form, this is one at an angle of negative 90 Degrees. Convert that to rectangular and you will see that that's equal to minus J1. So be very careful when you combine series impedances. Yes, we add them together, but we have to consider what we're adding and what is the polarity of the components that we're adding together. So we're going to combine these two impedances together and you'll convert that to polar to get 3.44 at an angle of 49.1 degrees. Next, we're going to take Z2, which is, remember, the combination of XC2, XL, and R2. We're going to take Z2 and combine that in parallel with R1. In order to do that, we have to use product over sum. That's the only tool we have to make that combination. So we're going to do R1 times Z2 divided by R1 plus Z2, and that's going to give us what I call Z3, which is our third combination. Z3 will represent the combination of R2, XL, XC2 and R1. So to make this combination, we're going to multiply on the top and have the sum on the bottom. I'm not gonna walk through every step of product over sum, that's been discussed several times in other lectures, but here's the work and all the steps that should be shown for this particular combination. And when you work through that combination, you'll end up with Z3 being 2.75 kilo ohms at an angle of 37.23 degrees. At this point, we're almost done. Our final total impedance value will be Z3 in series with XC1. So I'm going to take Z3, which is my final value right here. I'm going to convert that to polar. I'm sorry, convert that to rectangular and write it here. And I'm going to combine that with XC1. Since this is a capacitor, we're going to have minus J times the capacitive reactance of this capacitor, which is given as two kilo ohms. So when we make that combination, we'll end up with ZT being 2.22 kilo ohms at an angle of negative 8.82 degrees kilo ohms. Now we can find the total current in the circuit by using Ohm's law, Vs divided by ZT, you'll get your total current. And now we're going to find the voltage across R2. That's this resistor all the way on the end. So here's what we know. We know the total impedance and we know the total current. That's it. We've got to figure out the voltage across R2. In order to do that, we're going to have to take several steps. Here's the first step. When we made combinations earlier in order to determine total impedance, we defined Z3. Z3 was the combination of R1, XC2, XL, and R2. And when we made that combination to determine what Z3 was, Z3 was uh, in series with our final, our final capacitor, XC1. So what we're going to do is find the voltage across Z3 using a voltage divider. And when we find the voltage across Z3, our intent is that we'll use that to, 
to go forward and find the voltage across R2. So this is our first step to getting closer to finding the voltage across R2. We're going to start by finding the voltage across Z3. So I'm going to set up a voltage divider. The voltage across Z3 is going to be Z3, the impedance of Z3, divided by the total impedance in the circuit. Remember, that's going to be Z3 in combination with XC1 times the source. When we do that, we're going to get the voltage across Z3 to be 37.16 volts at an angle of 46.05 degrees. So that's step one, to find the voltage across Z3. Now, why did I do that? Well, the voltage across Z3 also represents the voltage across what Z3 replaced. Here's what Z3 replaced. Here's Z1. Z1 was in series with XC2. That gave us Z2. That was in parallel with R1. That's how we got to Z3. So the voltage across Z3 is equal to the voltage across what Z3 replaced. Z3 replaced the parallel combination of this branch and this branch. So by finding the voltage across Z3, I have found the voltage across R1. I know this voltage now. And what I want to do is set up a secondary voltage divider. If I know the voltage across R1, the voltage across R1 is connected to this branch here. This is a series branch. The voltage across R1 is going to divide among XC2 and Z1. If I set up a voltage divider to find the voltage across Z1, I can find the voltage across what Z1 replaced. Z1 replaced XL and R2 in parallel. So if I set up a voltage divider to find the voltage across Z1, I have found the voltage across XL and the voltage across R2, therefore solving the problem. So that's the plan of attack. This is not the only solution. This is one of many ways you could have decided to attack the problem. So let's set up a second voltage divider now to find the voltage across Z1. Remember, we know the voltage across R1, and we're trying to figure out how that voltage, the 37.16, how that voltage will divide among XC2 and Z1. So when we set up the voltage divider, we're gonna find the voltage across Z1, which is effectively the voltage across R2. We're gonna set that up by saying Z1 divided by Z2, which is the combination of Z1 and XC2. We've already calculated that multiplied by now watch here we're not multiplying by the source voltage because that's not the voltage that's being divided the voltage that's being divided is the voltage across r1 this voltage is divided among these two series components so i'm multiplying by the voltage across z3 which we just calculated in order to complete the voltage divider so once you have set this up and performed the calculation, you'll see that the voltage across Z1, which is the voltage for R2, is 45.81 volts at an angle of 55 degrees. Next, we're gonna find the current through C2. In order to do that, I'm gonna set up a current divider. And what we're going to be looking at with the current divider Here's XC1, here's R1, here's Z2. Remember, Z2 is the combination of R2, XL, and XC2. If I can figure out how much current went through Z2, that's the same thing as figuring out how much current left this node before it splits between XL and R2. I'm gonna be able to find this value if I set up a current divider and figure out how much current went through R1 and how much current went through everything else after this node. That's the goal. So the current through C2 is the same as the current through Z2. And I'm going to set up my current divider. My two parallel branches is the branch with R1 and the branch with Z2. So the numerator of my current divider has to be the parallel combination of these two branches. We've already calculated that, that's Z3. So I have the parallel combination of these two branches divided by the impedance of this branch right here, which is Z2. 
We're going to multiply that by the total current going into this node, which happens to be the total current in the circuit. Once you complete that calculation, you will have the current for C2. For our third problem, we're going to look at a final RLC circuit, series parallel RLC circuit, and we're going to be determining the impedance of the circuit, the total current in the circuit, the voltage across R1, R2, the inductor and the capacitor, and the current through R1, R2, L, and the capacitor in polar form. So we're going to start with total impedance of the circuit. Before we can start with total impedance of the circuit, we need to know capacitive reactance and inductive reactance. So calculate those first. Remember, those are formulas you should have memorized. So make sure that you, you are memorizing those formulas for an exam and plug in your values for L and C as well as the frequency to get capacitive reactance and inductive reactance. Now that we have that, let's identify our relationships resistor and the capacitor are in series. We're going to combine those in series. Once we make that combination, it's going to be in parallel with the inductor. Once we combine these two branches in parallel, what's left will be in series with R1. So that's going to be our plan of attack to find the total impedance in this circuit. Let's start by combining R2 and C2. They're in series. So when we have a resistor and a capacitor in series, we're going to do R minus JXC. So I'm going to plug in my values for R2 and XC. Convert that to polar. Next, we're going to do the combination of the inductor and Z1. Which again, you have to use product over sum for. That's the only tool we have to solve that. So you're going to take the value of the inductor written in polar form. So if you look at the numerator of the fraction, here's the value of the inductor, 18.85 kilo ohms at an angle of positive 90 degrees. That's what we're going to fill in for L. Z1 is going to be the 27.26 kilo ohms at an angle of negative 37.58 degrees. We're going to multiply those on the top, add them on the bottom. So perform the necessary work you need to apply product over sum and you'll get the value for Z2. Notice that the numerator comes out to be mega ohms when you make these two, uh, when you apply, when you multiply these two quantities together, you'll get mega ohms. But when you divide by kilo ohms, you'll get kilo ohms out. Now we're gonna find the total impedance of the circuit by taking Z2 and adding that to R1 because they're in series. So the impedance for R1 is 33 kilo ohms. In rectangular form, that would be 33 plus 0 J. So we have 33. Then Z2, we're going to take the value for Z2, written in polar form, and write it in rectangular form. Then we're going to make the combination and go back to polar for our final value of total impedance. Then we're going to use Ohm's law to find the total current in the circuit. Now we're going to find the voltage across R1, R2, the inductor, and the capacitor in polar form. Let's start with R1. We know the total current in the circuit, which means we know the current through R1. So we're going to use Ohm's law to find the voltage for R1. Next, let's find the current through the inductor by setting up a current divider. With my current divider, I have two branches. This is the first branch. This is the second branch. So I'm going to do a current divider where the numerator is going to be the parallel combination of the first branch and the second branch. We've already figured out that combination. That's Z2. So Z2 will go on your numerator and XL will go on your denominator of your current divider because this is the path I want the current for. And then we're going to multiply by IT because that's the total current going into this node before it splits. That will give you the current through the inductor. Then you can use Ohm's law to find the voltage for the inductor by taking your current through the inductor and multiplying by your inductive reactance. 
Now I'm going to find the voltage across R2. I'm going to do that by, by setting up a voltage divider. We know the voltage across the inductor, the voltage from this point to ground. We just figured that out. Well, we know that the voltage from this point to ground has to be the same as the voltage from this point to ground meaning the voltage across the inductor has to be equal to the sum of the voltage, drop, the voltage drops across the resistor and the capacitor. So the voltage across the inductor is divided between the resistor and the capacitor. So I'm going to set up a voltage divider to figure out how that voltage across the inductor is divided among these two components. So to set that up, I have R2 in the numerator because that's the, voltage, that's the component I want the voltage for. The denominator of my voltage divider is the total impedance for this series path. The voltage applied is applied across this series path. That's the impedance we're using for the denominator of our voltage divider. We're not using the total impedance of the circuit because that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at how the voltage from this node to ground is divided among these two series components. So the impedance of these two series components is what goes in the denominator. Then you're gonna multiply by the voltage applied to this node, which we know the voltage at that node, it's V out. So you're gonna set up your voltage divider and that's gonna give you the value for R2. We can use the same concept of a voltage divider to figure out the voltage for C2 as well. We're just gonna change the numerator of that voltage divider from R2 to XC, complete the calculation and you will get the voltage for C2. Now, if you're wondering why the voltage for R2 and the voltage for C2, if we look at these magnitudes, we have 4.34 and 3.34. If you're wondering, well, if I add those together, how come I don't get 5.47, the voltage across the inductor? Remember, that's not how we add polar quantities. If you wanna add these together, you're gonna to have to take it to rectangular first and then take it back to polar and see how closely your answer matches with this one. If you take these two coordinates, and you take them to rectangular, add them together, and then take it back to polar, you will get an answer very close to 5.47 at an angle of 27.82 degrees. All right, and that is our final example for series parallel RLC circuits. Make sure you are feeling comfortable using things like a voltage divider and a current divider in order to find an unknown value. Remember that you can use KVL and KCL as well but those are laws that rely on addition. Addition means you have to go to rectangular form. And so if you're going to use those laws to verify your work, which I do recommend, just remember to go to rectangular first. So at this point, I recommend that you practice, practice, practice. Look at the homework, look at the homework problems. Look at some of the additional problems that are at the end of the chapter. You can even go into multi-sim and design your own series parallel RLC circuits and then solve them. And you can use the measurement, the measurement tools in multi-sim in order to verify your work. But the name of the game here is practice. The more you practice, the better you will get at applying the tools and solving each one of these problems. If you need help understanding this lecture or the homework, please feel free to send me a message. And with that, that's the end of this video.